Hey, what's up? Welcome back to Mental Edge Training Coach here with Chad Hermanson. I'm excited to talk to a former classmate of mine today, John Denton. John was an amazing quarterback at Green Valley High School. We graduated together in 1995, and he went on to be a UNLV quarterback, a Division I quarterback, really a, did incredibly well his freshman year, broke Randall Cunningham's records, who was, of course, a former NFL player, played a very long time. So had an amazing career at UNLV that was somewhat cut short by some circumstances that happened in his life. So we're going to discuss some of those things, some of the things that he went through both on and off the field, what he's up to now. So enjoy this conversation with John Denton. All right, John Denton, what's up, dude? Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great, man. Great to see you. It's It's been a while. It's great to see you. We were uh, doing a little pre-show here. It's not too often I get a, a former classmate, right? Graduated the same year. And I was looking back, I was like, man, you had a, a really phenomenal career as, as, a, as a potential NFL player, um, college athlete. And I was kind of looking back, I was like realizing like how good you actually were coming out of Green Valley. I'm like, dude, Den's legit. Like he's the guy. Um, so we were just kind of discussing. So I first met you, um, I think it was, I don't even know if it was at Cannon. Did you go to Cannon or was it Green Valley? Just Woodbury. 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 Okay. So we met at Green Valley, uh, basically. Yep. Now you mentioned, it's kind of funny before, um, I was thinking to myself, at what point did you stop playing baseball? Because now you're, you're my first football guy, right? So we're, we're diving into new sports now. So there we go. you played mainly basketball and football. Tell us about your story about how you just said, uh, and I'm done with baseball. I'm good. Yeah. So before <laughs> I dive into that, though, just so uh, just for the record, all of us football players, because you didn't play any sport other than baseball, us football and basketball players always thought you would have been a, a tremendous addition to our teams because you were the best athlete in our high school. So don't don't let anybody <laughs> fool, fool us. We just uh, we just look different on the field. You just did it uh, more eloquently on the on the diamond. So. Um, well, I remember, I remember Coach Carpenter was, yeah. uh, every time he saw us in PE, like, hey, come here. <laughs> well, I played the church league with you guys. You remember yeah. the church league, and I'm going, I'm trying to recruit you every time. I'm like, I'm not guarding him. I'm picking him on my team. Uh, to bring her. But, uh, I know. But yeah. Well, basketball was always the sport, like, growing up. Like, you could you could go practice for hours by yourself, and I did that. 100%. Like, it was kind of, like, baseball was my first love in a way, but I'm like, basketball, dude, was so fun. And they just shoot, just shoot forever. But anyway, please, yeah, tell us well, about. Was the same, yeah, that was the same yeah. thing with me. I was a, I was a football guy growing up. My dad coached me, but you know when I met you know all the guys that we had got incorporated with back in our early high school days from you know the other side of town when they did the social blending of our high school. You know you get to the point where basketball was a passion of mine just because I could shoot. Um, but yeah, I came out of Green Valley and had a had a nice little. Uh, Nice little two or three year run on the varsity squad. Had some good opportunity to go play uh, Division One football at about five or six universities around the uh, the West Coast, and uh, chose to stay home, uh, play football for UNLV, and uh, you know had a had a good run there as well. Tell us about your option because your senior year in, in Green Valley, like you, we had a very good football team. We were a newer school. I think we were in our what third year. Oh, I guess it was our fourth year because yeah, we that freshmen. was our fourth year. Yeah, fourth year so we, we, we were. In Spain kind of just getting established right yeah. I mean, you guys had an incredible team what was that like your senior year you mentioned all these schools that were recruiting you what were some of those schools yeah so you had utah utah state washington uh washington state and san diego state were the uh, five other schools that i had a chance to go to full ride offers and yeah you mentioned it I, I played football from you know obviously my freshman year on and back then it was hey you had to go on the freshman team first you know, put, put together your, uh, your skill sets and all that stuff. And I developed, you know, probably about 15 or 20 of us. Um, some that I'm still the friends with to this day that, you know, obviously is, or your friends with as well. Um, but we created a bond and we went nine and zero that freshman year and mm -hmm. it really built after that. And, um, a lot of us got called up, uh, midway through the season, um, our, our uh, sophomore year for JV, uh, JV to varsity when we made the playoffs that year. And, we actually got spanked and uh, we came back that summer, trained super hard and said, you know, hey, you guys were winning on the baseball diamond already early on our freshman and sophomore years. So we were like, hey, man, we're a winning school. You know, folks think that we're the rich kids, you know, all this, uh, you know, all the hype around us. And I'm like, 
last thing I remember, I don't have a car, right? I don't drive a car around <laughs> right here, right? So I'm blue collar, just like you guys. So let's yeah. get to work. And then, you know, junior year, we, you know, we had a great year. We made the playoffs, but then um, my senior year, yeah, we were 12 and 0, 13 and 0 going into the state title game. And then, you know, ended up losing that state title game to uh, Wooster uh, that year, yeah. which was a little heartbreaking, but uh, yeah, good run though. Yeah, no doubt. So those are some great teams. D, I mean, these are yeah. big D1 programs. So like, just wanted to show like, like you were a legit prospect coming out of high school, mm -hmm. a lot of hype going on for you. Um, great team surrounded all that. So you, you decided to choose UNLV. What was that decision like for you? Um, it was, uh, again, it was, it was family based, you know, my mom and dad were here. They, my dad had coached me. Um, you know, my, my, my relatives were close. They lived in LA and, and Arizona. So I figured that I would be able to centrally, you know, be able to play in front of friends and family more than I would anywhere else. And I think the final straw was the fact that I was able to come in and challenge for the starting position right away as a young freshman, a uh, red shirt freshman. I did red shirt. Um, so I put on about 25 pounds from high school and, uh, Woke up one day as the starting quarterback at UNLV and first game at Peyton Manning in Tennessee, you know, so it. Um, no kidding. Yeah. So Holy cow. It, it all ended up being really fast over the course of like a, you know, a 12 month period. But uh, my redshirt year was crucial for me because, you know, I went from 6'3", 6'4", 175 to uh, 6'4", 215, 220. Yeah. And was a legit size kid as a freshman, which which helped a lot, too. Yeah. And I, that's what I was like, I think I ran into you. I think it was at, in Hawaii. I don't know if you remember. Yes. Yeah. So I, I was, do. I was playing in the Hawaiian winter league when that was going on. So that was what, I think the fall of 96, no, what 96. was that? 96. Yeah. 96. And so you showed up, you're playing Hawaii and I just happened to go there. I'm like, John, what's up dude? You're like, you're like totally waving. Yeah, I remember, like, man. I remember. Like, shouldn't you day, be 100%. playing the game right now? 100%. 100%. <laughs> Probably got yeah. yelled at too. Yeah, I probably got yelled at. I probably got you in trouble. But we exactly. like if you think like we were teenagers, right? And so just trying yeah. to figure things out. So now Randall Cunningham, mm -hmm. you know, amazing quarterback of the Eagles. Um, I didn't did he go to high school out here? Is he, he just from Santa here? Barbara? I think he's from Cali, Santa so Barbara. Then, then he moved here. Yep. Eventually. Okay. Yep. And I, I think he still coaches here somewhere locally, possibly. Uh, I'm not sure if he coaches. I know he's still got a ministry here, um, Remnant Ministries, uh, out on Wigwam, okay. so out there in Green Valley, Henderson area. Um, okay. I don't think he coaches anymore. It wasn't Silverado. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, we so obviously amazing career with the Eagles. Did mm -hmm. all these things. Now you came in and you started breaking some records here that Cunningham had at UNLV. So yeah. now we're talking about setting the stage for like, oh, dude, maybe this guy is an NFL prospect. Yeah. Right. This guy's now you're saying you're six, four, two twenty now, like now you're looking like Peyton Manning, you know? <laughs> so I, I was curious, what was that game like going to Tennessee? What was that? 80, 90,000 fans at that game? Uh, yeah, actually a hundred and 108,000. Um, it was incredible. the largest game, the largest game that UNLV's played in uh, ever still to this day. Um, yeah, it was uh, the buildup obviously was, you know, shock the nation, shock the nation. You know, you think about it now it's like we had no chance back then, but <laughs> um, you go into the stadium and it's, uh, you know, it's another Friday, you have your practice round or your practice, uh, intercession practice, and then you can wake up Saturday. And when you came to the stadium, like the bus pulled up and you just, it, it, it the, the atmosphere was different, um, mm -hmm. than anything I had ever, ever felt. And it feels like going to like a stadium nowadays, like Allegiant stadium, when there's 80,000 Raider fans or people in there, it's just, it was just a different level of, um, intensity and, uh, yeah, 108,000, but First snap, I mean, I'm telling you, this is just the truth. I really don't remember much of the crowd uh, mm -hmm. throughout the game. And, uh, you know, it was uh, – I was competing. You know, those guys were talking smack on the field. And uh, I was a young freshman out of Green Valley High School. And I was going <laughs> to show the world that I belonged on this stage. And yeah. um, so my, I wasn't any shy – I wasn't shy of any uh, confidence or any moxie by any means at that point. Uh, I felt like I belonged. I act like it. I walked and I talked it. Um and I was just not going to let my play uh, disappoint folks. And that's just how I approached it that year. I, I love what you just said. Because as you can imagine, like, so when I'm working with kids, right, and I know you work with kids too, like a lot of them, they're lacking confidence, right? Oh, and not believing themselves. But you just said, like, I acted like it. I walked like it. What were, how did you start to learn in regards to just like the mental game in regards to your own building, your own confidence in that regard? Yeah, I started to trust myself. Um, 
really in just the, I put a lot of work in, you know, back then that we didn't have the, the media tools now to where we could show everybody we were working, right? You got very few times a year to show your skills, right? Mm -hmm. So what are you doing? My dad put a lot of emphasis in the early days of you've got to do stuff where people aren't looking, right? You got to put the time in where folks may not be putting the time. And I did that early. And I can, even in my career as I am now as a, as a, as a leader of people on teams, I do the same thing, right? You've got to be able to hyper-focus on areas where you're deficient. And so I just worked on my game and I just worked on my game and trusted that process. Um, even though that's very cliche nowadays, but I really just trusted myself. Um, and when I got my chance to start as a junior and uh, for Green Valley, I trusted the fact that I, I worked, right? And then same thing with UNLV. Um, you know, I was not the first pick of these coaches to be the starting quarterback that year, right? There was juniors and seniors in front of me, but I approached that fall camp when they said it's an open competition of I'm the starter and you guys are going to have to beat me out, right? And that's the way it was approached. And I never looked back after that. I love that. That's awesome. So you, you're, you just had the mindset of like, this is my job. I don't care how young I am. I'm going to, I'm going to go take it. Right. Plus, and then, I, plus I had just put on 25 pounds in the weight room, Chad. So I, <laughs> so I looked a little bit different, right? I looked a little bit different. <laughs> you were that, you were that scrawny six, three, right? No, yeah. no, well, no, that, no. I could have used that, man. I, I didn't hit 200 pounds till I was 30. Like my last year I played, yeah. I could, I could never put weight on. So we kind of have the same frame. <laughs> you know, I think we, I was six two, one seventy five when I graduated, you know, yeah. just it's kind of skin and bone, but, um, that, that's funny though. I could have, yeah. could have used coach Castro back in the day. When... <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. 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 That's cool. Well, that's awesome. So you, you have your, you're breaking records, you red shirted, you come back and you're, you're playing against Peyton Manning right away. Season starts to go along. Something happens freshman year. You get in trouble, right? You get in trouble with the school. Um, I was unaware of this because I was so involved in my life in, in yeah. football that I, I was like, oh, I knew this like le years later. I was totally unaware of this. Um, so walk us through like what happened at UNLV to where they had to let you go. Yeah, well, it was uh, it was actually my sophomore year. Um, so I'd gone through my freshman year. I had broken a bunch of records. So I had, uh, you know, in essence, climbed the ladder from a from a fame status in Vegas, because again, we didn't have any Vegas Knights, we didn't have any, uh, you know, T-Mobile Arena, we didn't have any pro teams, right? So it was Rebels, Rebels, Rebels. And, uh, you know, so I was put on this pedestal of the next savior, the next Randall. And, you know, it was, uh, I just, I, I made a couple decisions that following year that were of the 18, 19 year old decision um, tree. And, uh, you know, Got to, got myself in a little trouble. Um, I wasn't asked to leave. I wasn't kicked out. I had to, I served a suspension, but at the same time, I voluntarily removed myself from the school just because uh, it got a little hot in the kitchen for me. And um, at that time, I wasn't, as you and I have discussed early on, I wasn't prepared uh, mentally um, to fall from that pedestal that fast. Um, and again, we're 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 talking about it relatively quickly here, but it was over the course of a few months, and it was building up. And after the season, that second year, and you know, I went from uh, Heisman Trophy candidate, the school putting you up to uh, you know the school basically not wanting to do with you and wanting anything to do with you, um, or at least like, hey, you're a you're losing stature or you're losing rank with our with our staff. And yeah. so I didn't know how to react. You know, I did not act, and I <laughs> I, uh, I did the best thing that I thought I possibly could, which was really fold inside, like really become internal and uh, really uh, segregated myself from a lot of people that could have helped me at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, especially coaches, players that I, that I've grown, you know, accustomed to trusting on the football field, like lost trust in all of that system. So, um, so yeah, it was a, it was a fall from grace that uh, um, was fairly, fairly rapid in my mm -hmm. life. Yeah. And you're what, 19 at this time? Yeah, roughly? 19. Yeah, I was 19? 19. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, like I said, making a teenage mistake, you know, whatever that mistake looks like. And so you're 19, essentially we're still kids, right? Yeah. We're kids. We think we're men, right? We're trying to figure it out, but we're well, still, I thought I was for sure. Yeah. Like we're, 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 we're acting, right. We're playing the game. Absolutely. Uh, thinking we're big boys and, and I guess we should act as big boys too at 19. So that happens. You end up leaving, you know, V. So where do you go after, you know, V? So I transferred one double A back then again. Things were a little different in the uh, landscape of college athletics where you just couldn't pick your bags and hop to the next school and play for five schools in five years. So I had to actually drop a level, went down to Eastern Kentucky, um, 
set a bunch of passing records at Eastern Kentucky, um, made it to the Division II playoff or the one AA playoffs that year. Again, um, had some success there and um, ended up uh, electing to go into the NFL draft my junior year um, and pulling my senior year card out of there and just making the decision to, to, to continue on and try to get paid doing something I love. Okay. So you, you go to Eastern, you t- now that, yeah, cause it's just like, you can't go from a D one and I'm just going to go now to yeah. university of Kentucky. I got to yeah. go a, a level down. Yeah. What, what did you learn that year? She said like through that process of kind of during your sophomore year, you weren't quite ready mentally for what was happening. What did you learn from that when you went to Eastern Kentucky? Well, I don't think I learned, honestly, I didn't, I don't think I learned a lot until my playing career ended okay. um, or my, my pursuit of my dream after that from a, from a professional standpoint ended. Um, when you look back on there, it was again, a lot of self inflicted, I don't want to say wounds because I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything to harm myself or anybody around me. I just was very introverted. Um, okay. I used to be, you know, me, I'm a, I'm an extrovert. I love, I love people. I love talking. I love being, I don't want to say life in the party, but making jokes and, but I, I went through a period where, you know, it seemed like, Every everything was against me. Like I had to, uh, my my proven self wasn't enough, and you know, so I just battled some of that stuff. So it was really when I transferred to Eastern Kentucky, it was from a chance for me. I didn't have any friends out there. I knew absolutely nobody. Mm-hmm. Right? It was so out of characteristic. My mom and dad even said they were like they went out on the field on I see that say field trip. They went out on the recruiting trip with me, and my dad was like, "You're not coming to this place, are you?" And I'm like, <laughs> absolutely. Where else and, am I going to go? Right. Yeah. Like, well, I had, I mean, it was Portland. I had, I had, I had areas where I could have gone and okay. I mean, I could have gone to Alabama and sat out a year because that's where my offensive coordinator um, at UNLV. And one of the reasons why I kind of felt a little bit of slight towards some of the folks there was I lost a couple coaches along the way too, for some reasons, but mm-hmm. um, they went to Alabama. I could have transferred there and sat out and really had a senior year to play at a really big school, but I didn't want to sit out. And to me, you know, for me, sitting out and being inactive was was kind of the anti of what I needed at that time, right? I needed to be active. I needed to be around teams and playing and um, keep my mind off of the stuff that I had thought, you know, I thought I lost a lot, especially when I left UNLV, leaving a lot of people down. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And so then you you have your pretty good year at Eastern Kentucky, and now we're talking NFL draft. You, yeah. you put yourself up for that. So walk us through that process. What was that like? Yeah, so that was a that was a that was a crazy process because you obviously you have to get an agent, you have to go through the vetting process. I wasn't a senior, so I didn't even get to go to the combine. Um, so I held a lot of private workouts. You know, I had a lot of I uh, went to UNLV's pro day, uh, went to Eastern Kentucky's pro day. So I was in good graces with a lot of people that I probably you know a few years before um, you know maybe have burned a bridge or two at that time. So I started repairing those patches and you know, the Dolphins came to me in 99 and said, you know, you're somebody that we're targeting, you know, late fourth, fifth, sixth round. And, and I'm like, great, you know, and little do you know through that process that that's a very tight knit community, right. And coaching in itself is a tight knit community. And some of the people that I burned those bridges with, you know, happen to be tight knit with some of the folks making decisions. And, you know, I just got a, I got labeled as a, as one of those hot head kind of, you know, uh, I don't want to say all for myself kind of kids, but that's kind of what I was labeled as and uh, which is exactly opposite of what I ever grew up and whatever I wanted to present. Right. So I built this reputation of, you know, you know, Johnny instead of John, you know, it was kind of like, you know, no, it's not me, but now I'm going to play it because that's what they want. To, that's what they want. That's what they're going to get. You know, so I go to the Dolphins and you know, the same thing. This is my show. This is, you know, I'm badass here, you know, but you got Randall Cunningham or um, Dan Marino sitting in the locker room. You've got these other pros that have been nine, 10 years in the locker room. And it's like, now you really need to pipe, pipe down there, rookie. So you Marino's know? still playing at this point? That was his last year. Yeah. Was, okay. Yeah. His yeah. last year. Um, and it was. Uh, Did he teach anything? He threw the ball. Man, this guy had a really, really hard spiral. He had a, he, he had a hose on him. Um, one of those just always, always on, right? You never, you know, those guys that always just throw the baseball super yeah. hard. First throw to the last throw. He was one of those guys that, um, and you always try to get somebody to catch the balls. He's warming up he's with. <laughs> catch his, but he's considered that one of the best NFL arms of all time, isn't he? One of them. Yeah, I think like I think they call him probably one of the best ever to yeah. not win a Super Bowl. Obviously, for yeah. sure. But, uh, but yeah, he's he's had a couple of the greatest statistical years ever. Um, you know, he's a 
didn't really speak much. And, you know, again, that's probably one of those growing phases where I did, where I had an opportunity to pick the mind, one of the greatest of all times. And I was so self-absorbed with, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, my suburban had gas and tinted windows. And, you know, at that time, and it's like, I'm in South beach, like, I told you before the call, like I thought I had made it, you know, and I'm like, I didn't even make the, I hadn't even made the roster yet. And I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm, I played with the dolphins, you know, <laughs> you know one of those things, but uh, so you come back down to reality fairly quickly for sure. Mm-hmm. Got to get, get that bumping system in there, right? It's all. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So then that was, so it was 99 with the dolphins. So, yeah. and you mentioned earlier, you, you went through a couple preseasons with the, was it a couple different teams? Yeah, so I went through off seasons, pre seasons with about four or five different NFL teams. Uh, been cut probably by seven or eight of them. Uh, been cut by two or three CFL teams after that. Trying to just trying to catch on over the course of you know the next three years. And um, was in Edmonton Eskimos for for a few you know a few games and got cut just because of um, you know international rules and stuff like that. So there's just a lot of stuff that was working not in my favor as I'm trying to pursue this dream and really think that, uh, you know, that I'm, I don't want to say owed something, but, you know, I thought that I was definitely a a professional athlete um, Mm -hmm. to the T, you know, and I hadn't even really cracked the professional level yet. And it was just a different mindset that I was just, I'd always got away with telling myself that I was going to do it, that I was this, I was that. And at some point, right, it all leveled out and um, took me, took me a minute to realize that. Um, Mm -hmm. So and so when you, you, cause you mentioned like six or seven or eight teams, when you got yeah. cut trying to make these pro teams, you get cut, you try to go to the what, CFL, AF, there's different, different yeah. types. Did you play for teams during those five, six, seven years you were cut? Or did you like get cut and then go get a job and then come back? Like, what was that? Yeah, like? you're, you're in that cycle. Yeah. You're in that yeah. cycle of uh, spending a couple months in a training camp or in the preseason or whatever it is with a team. And then, you know, your, your financial responsibilities are mounting, right. As you're, as you're having kid number two in the back end, right. And you're like, your wife's like, Hey, what are we looking at? You know, and I'm working full time. You're not really working at all. Right. It's like, <laughs> you're um, just training. Yeah, right? you're, you're, you're pursuing, <laughs> right. You're pursuing, right. One of those things. And I'm yeah. like, no, fine. Yeah. So at some point, you know, you, you hit you, the, the scale tips out of your favor. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, so ended up, obviously stopping the stopping the pursuit uh, of the dream and going into the real world you know um uh, so yeah it was uh, like i said definite transition from thinking that i was uh, on cloud 9 and should be on cloud 9 deserved cloud 9 to um now going and having to get a, a 9 to 5 you know mm-hmm. well i mean it, it's commendable too though you kept grinding after it after no 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 oh, yeah right? Five, six, seven times cut. So that's, I mean, that's very familiar with the, you, you make it to the big leagues. Now you're not on that 40 man roster. You're a spring training invite. You don't make the team, you go back to the minor leagues and then you you just keep trying that grind year after year. And then after a while you're like, okay, we got kids. We have to make some decisions here. Now I'm it, at what point did you, was your, let's say, professional career over with? How old were you at that point? It was 2004, 2005. So uh, whatever that was, she's probably mid-20s, early 20, like 24, 25-ish, something like that. Um, yeah, 27, something like that. So yeah. I pursued it for four or five years after that. And um, like I said, it, it got to a point where the scales started tipping outside yeah. of my face from like a revenue project, uh, pro, uh, revenue producing standpoint. So, um, yeah, I think it was 26, 27. Yeah. It, it's just amazing how, like the, how fast the window just starts to close, right. Oh, yeah. when, you, when you don't make it right away out of college or you're dry, you're drafted. And, and then each year you're like, oh man, this is going to be even harder and harder. I just, yeah. I just did a, my last episode was with a guy named Jalal Leach, who I, and I'm trying to remember, I think it was, it took him 10 years to get, to the wow. big leagues okay you know so that's you just talk about grinding it out right grinding. so it's yeah yeah I, I think that's kind of the the back end of i think what really most majority of the athletes go through that we don't hear about because we hear all the let's say the the guys that are playing for the raiders you know or the, all these nfl guys 
but there's so many guys behind the scenes, right, on the practice squads, yep. right, and, and trying to make those teams. Tell you, you kind of made a joke earlier about when you were in preseason about all these passes you would make to get receivers ready. Tell us, tell us about that a little bit. Um, which one? What? Are you, which one were you talking about? Well, like we, I think we were joking about. Yeah, I, I throw 500 passes a day. Like, yeah, I'm really just getting the oh. receivers ready. <laughs> Yeah, you'd get signed. You get signed by the Chiefs, or you get signed by you know Bengals or whatever it was, and you know they'd bring you in for like the, the the April, May, and June, and then the training, like the early training camp, would start like right around mid June or something like that, and you'd make it all the way to there, and they'd cut you, and you'd realize after like the third time that you're none of the receivers that you threw with over the last three months or this any of them made it as well. They were all on. They were all getting tryouts just like you were on the tryout. So you're thinking like. Oh man, they signed me. I'm going through their summer workouts. I'm going through their, you know, there's their weights. There's, you know, their, and then you go through, and you're like, no, man, they're using your like an agent. Really, is my second agent that I had really explained it to me well, and um, it was my last year, but that I got the agent. And he was a good guy, and he was actually the one that probably said, hey, it might be time for you to go go find. He was one of those ones that kind of helped. He was like, look, yeah. you're you're just you're just you're just going to keep grinding into these lower leagues, and you know, you got talent. Go do something else, but. You just get to a point where, hey, you're an arm. It's all they're using you for, right? They're giving you a nice little stipend, letting you hit the cafeteria three times a day, throw weights around, and you think you're an NFL player. They think you're an arm, you know? So at that point, it started to shift that mindset of, wow, I'm really not chasing my dream, right? I'm actually kind of like just prolonging the, you know, the, you know, the inevitable, you know? Which is a great feeling, isn't it? <laughs> yeah no I, well it was it's kind of yes and no and I, I i probably most folks are sitting there probably going to see this and go yeah it was probably a crappy feeling but to me it was almost like a relief right because i because i had spent four or five years trying to chase something that um that i had built up you know in my past that i was trying to live up to and i was like all right next chapter i'm ready to yeah. go but like yeah. I was, so that that's kind of how that ended um, so, I mean, to me, it was, yeah, it was bittersweet because I wasn't doing something that I love, but, you know, mm -hmm. at the same time, I, I wanted to detach myself from John, the football player. And even to this day, it's, it's impossible. I think yeah. that's the, that's the hard part too, <clears throat> is that you still go where you're at and you're still known for some of that stuff you did prior to these folks, even, you know, knowing in the last 20 years, you know? Yeah. And that kind of led you to now, so you, you left Vegas, right? Yeah. And, and tell us where you are now. You're out. In Iowa somewhere. In the yeah, southwest Iowa, about an hour <laughs> southeast of uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Live uh, with the wife and three kids um, in a uh, in a nice little rural, you know, community out in the out in the cornfields, man. Um, mm -hmm. You know, nice and quiet. Uh, it does get snow, which you know, me being from Vegas is, uh, you know, and, and and the hips and the knee, right? Don't don't like the snow, man. Um, <laughs> a, a lot of shoveling out there. Yeah, well, you get you get a you, you do it smart. You get a snowblower, you know, there you, you get go. a snowblower if, if you got a decent driveway like we do. And but yeah, it's uh it's definitely a, a different change for us. You know, I've been out here ten years, and um, you know, it's uh it's good good people, good climate, good business, good good habits out here for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and now you have been married for a while. You have three kids. And yeah. Tell us about your kids because you were telling me that you got some amazing athletes in your family. Except they got all the genes apparently. Is that yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly yeah three daughters uh 22 2015 uh the oldest one was a, was a great golfer um my middle one is a heptathlete for nebraska omaha currently right now so she runs the uh multi events for those uh for them and then my 15 year old is a high school basketball and track athlete uh all state all conference uh, in both those sports right now in iowa so yeah definitely picked up the uh the athletic uh gene for me and uh they're all great students. Uh, the older two are in medical field are going to be in the medical field, my middle one. So mm. um, definitely proud. Like I said, I'm, uh, you know, things worked out for the best for me and made some good decisions along the way uh, after, after becoming a father that I'm proud of and, you know, uh, yeah. good kids, man, really good kids, good family. I'm blessed. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's with all those sports in the ages, I have to imagine you were just all over the place growing up with them as young kids and, yeah, yeah, all over the place. I was just like you and with, you know, with the kids. And nowadays you you want to, I didn't want to live my dreams through them, but I wanted to help them live their dreams as they saw. It. And I said, ladies, whatever you guys want to do, I can help you shoot. I can help. I mean, you can't play football. There's not really a league for that out here. They don't have flag out here. So 
I can help you hit a golf ball. I can help you, I can help you, you know, run a little track. I can do whatever. So they really ended up, you know, I became their, I became their confidant and their coach, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I pushed them probably a lot harder than most people would have in, in their, in their, in their schools or in their coaching um, realm. So I think that was good. It helped them see that, uh, you know, plus their dad was a, was a good athlete. You know, they, they were exposed early on to not only my successes, but my, my failures and why I wasn't playing anymore. And because that was, again, why don't you have, why don't you play anymore? Why aren't you playing anymore? You know, one of those things. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, so wouldn't, uh, wouldn't trade for the world, man. Yeah, that's incredible. Now, did you, from my understanding, did you do, um, did you coach some football out there at one I point? I did. Tell us uh, about that. So I volunteered uh, in, in Vegas too, Green Valley a few years, but then I also, um, so out here, it's kind of funny. I, I move out here and I'm kind of working from home, working remote and, you know, I'm like, I need something to do with my time and a little local paper out here. And again, out here, folks still pay by checks, right? You can't, you can't uh, pay your bill online to, to pay your water bill. You got to go down and actually talk to the local clerk down here. So I do live in rural America, folks. It is, uh, yeah. it is kind of rural, but, um, but yeah, it's uh, the, the same thing. We're, we're trying to um, take probably four or five different, um, I don't know, you talk like sections of this little town, you can't do anything from a technology standpoint, right? So AAU for us and growing up and taking these kids everywhere was non-existent, right? So you had to coach, you had to develop skills locally, and that was non-existent when I started. So I got this paper, I looked at it, they said Essex High School head coach, looking for them, I went and applied, I got the job, I walked in the first day, I really did not realize that it was eight-man football um, mm -hmm. until I got in. And so eight man football to me was new, right? And I'm like, well, this is just a real league, man. This is yeah. just a real league with some pads, you know, on a bigger field. Let's here's the here's the playbook from the Las Vegas Gladiators. Let us learn routes. And for like two or three years, we had one of the top eight man offenses in the state of Iowa um, with my kids, and we, we weren't very good, uh, didn't win very many games, but the kids had a great time. And you know, it's always cool when you see three or four of them now are police officer, sheriff, mm. um, you know, community members, stuff like that is, is mid 20 year old kids. Right. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's interesting when you, you go back and revisit with coaches that coached you say in high school and they would always talk about like, we're, we're trying to teach you guys life lessons here. Yeah. Right. Of this is how the real world is, is difficult. It's hard. Yeah. Right? And so like you, you mentioned earlier that you, you were actually pretty tough on your girls. Yeah. You know, as, as far as their coach, was there anything when you were coaching them, you're like, am I too tough on them? Do I need to pull back a little bit? I, I yeah, well, I, I don't think I necessarily thought that to myself. I would always ask my wife that, like, because mm -hmm. again, it was an open, you know, we have an open forum in our house. And when we sit at the dinner table, you know, and how was your day? Well, this, this and that, you know, I give my two cents on I'm not a gray area guy. It's black or white. And, um, you know, and I, after that, was that a little too harsh? You know, one of those things, was that, was that, did that come across okay? And she's like, well, you know, like, there's been a couple of those times you could have delivered it a little bit differently. Um, right. Yeah. I think uh, in, in the long run, I think as they've grown up and they get into the real world, right. They realize that one of them's got an apartment, you know, she's paying, she's got her own bills and, you know, stuff like that. As you, as you know, you, that sets you up for some of that stuff, right? And uh, to be able to be successful as a as a young adult and then trans you know transform into a into a positive adult citizen, right? You got to have a good good foundation, and that's all we were trying to do. And we just happened to do it through sports. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking at behind right behind your head there. Is that Kobe? I see. Is that is that the Black Mamba book right there? Oh yeah, the, the, that's the Mamba book there. Tell Here's us about. Kobe, tell us Kobe about that. Yeah, tell us about the Black Mamba. Like, what can you teach us about that? Yeah, man, it's uh, it's all about attitude and um, and outlook. And I think when you when you read the book and when you and again, I'm not a I don't like remember any of the quotes that he's saying or anything, but I just know a lot of the things that I remember feeling, you know, before he passed, after he passed. Reading this stuff is that uh, you know, it's all about attitude and outlook, right? You you have to have a positive out attitude. You have to have a positive outlook, no matter what the dire situations are in front of you. And, you know, down 10, fourth quarter, right? Or even, you know, facing unemployment in life, right? You, you, you've you got to be able to respond in certain ways in certain situations. And I think the more you train and have that outlook, like I can expect this or I can expect that, I think we train ourselves to, uh, to, to be adaptive in those situations. And that's exactly what that is. And, um, you know, he's a, he's, he's one of my all-time favorites. I'm not a Laker fan by any means, but. <laughs> um, 
he's uh he's definitely one of the I instill a lot of his stuff and still send quotes to my kids <clears throat> to this day about some of the life lessons that he's that he's yeah. uh, written this book. Yeah, I, I've learned more about him myself too. Um, it was been more through Tim Grover, the author. Mm -hmm. I think he wrote he he trained Michael Jordan, yep. Kobe, Dwayne Wade, some of those guys. I think the books are he wrote are uh, relentless and uh, winning. I think are the two of yep. his books. And yep. he's he's a very kind of sounds like how you coach your daughters, right? Like, look, this is how it is, right? I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to tell you how it is. It reminds me of coach fairless <laughs> when I was in high school. Yep. I right? just like, Hey, if you want to succeed, like this is how it is. It does seem a little bit like coaches have, uh, have changed a little bit over time, right? Where I guess they pick and choose like, okay, when do I need to be a little tough and hard on them? When do I need to back off a little bit? Um, you know, and I've certainly seen that here locally, like at more of the baseball level in regards to that. And, um, we would joke around like, you know, coach Fairless couldn't coach today. He would get thrown in jail, you know, yeah. no. No. <laughs> stuff like that. So they, they, I guess I've had to learn over time. Like I got to back up just a, just a little bit. And then when I need to put the throttle on, I will type thing. Yeah. So I guess that's how you evolve too, as a coach. Yeah, you have to, I think you have to. And I, Added, well, I mean, we all have our takes of why that is. You have to evolve and where it's come from and where it is now. I think everybody's got their own opinion on it. But yeah, we definitely have have to meet those students or those kids or your, you know, your players at a, at the level or at the at that intersection, right? And you have to be able to 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 go to different intersections is what I usually say to my team here, right? Is that we're gonna we're gonna meet. We may not, you know, we may not always agree. We may not always see eye to eye, but when we you know, you have to have some sort of common understanding that when we intersect, right, there's communication, right, there's reasons to take from this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's good. I, my, my kids accepted it. The fact that I told them from early on, you want me involved, right? And you're going to have to understand that I'm an all in kind of guy, right? And this is what you get. Um, so I think they saw me coaching football and how passionate I was with the kids and the time I put in. And so they wanted that for themselves. So that's why I quit coaching football. Um, to really don't you know really dedicate the the focus to travel like traveling yeah, around yeah. here man to go to a basketball game I mean you're you're sometimes you're traveling an hour hour and a half away because the conference is so spread out so it doesn't really leave much time for me to focus on a football coaching job so I you know I really focused on them over the last you know six or seven years of their of their high school years yeah absolutely well that's awesome man so tell us a little bit about what are you doing now out in yeah. Iowa out in the the rural area there and how yeah. did your career like your life as an athlete how did that transition for you into your your life and your work yeah I've, I've always been in sales so as I uh, as I got nudged by the wife one day and said it's time to it's time to get in the real world you know I ended up falling into a couple startups on sales and um, getting involved in the kind of the whole startup ecosystem. Um, so I've been the last 10, 12 years, I've been involved in like high level startups and cybersecurity and literally made a complete 360 from uh, a career uh, move over the last uh, year and got into franchise development. So okay. I work for a company now that does franchise development out of Omaha. And um, again, it's uh, a complete 360 from what I've done for the last 10 or 12 years. And Again, going back to those same feelings of transition and like unknown, like what am I getting myself into? I was a football player. Now I'm going to the real world. Well, you know, now with software, now I'm going to the franchising, right? So you ask about, you know, how did that transfer? How did sports, right? It was all about the, you know, the preparation, right? Of coming into this position, right? I learned, I had to learn a lot. So put a lot of onus on myself to prepare well, um, obviously open myself up to people that are around me that are doing well, right. That are obviously um, making money and providing, you know, a great return for the company. Like, Hey, what are you doing? How can I pick your brain? So, um, and that's how I was at football, right. I, there was guys that were ahead of me my freshman year that were really good passers. They had good footwork. You know, I was like, Hey, how did you do this? How'd you do that? So very, very curious. Um, but yeah, so I'm in uh, business sales and uh you know, it's uh, I lead a I lead a team of development people over here, and um, we just uh, we get after it on a daily basis. We run it like a sports team. You know, we're all accountable <laughs> for our own at bats, and um, you know, we all got closed. We all got a hitting record. We all got a fielding percentage, and you know, we just kind of throw those stats together. And at the end of the day, we try to win, man. And uh, yeah, that's you know, awesome. Yeah, 
That's awesome. I love how you just incorporated fielding percentage. Yeah, you sales like that, huh? oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's <laughs> got a batting <laughs> average around here. <laughs> and the thing they call the Mendoza line, right? The Mendoza Absolutely. line. So right. people, most people don't realize that I, I mean, I, I'm not, I love baseball, but I always say that whoever's hit behind the Mendoza or uh, below the Mendoza line this week is going to do all the, do all our dirty work, do all the chores. And folks are like, what's the Mendoza line? I'm like, just Google it. <laughs> Google, it. So, Google it, man. Yeah. That's awesome. That's well, John, man, this has been incredible. I, I appreciate you sharing your story. I, I think it's an important one, you know, that it, it, you resiliency within athletes. And I think that's why companies like athletes so much is they've, they've been through that grind. They know what it's all about. It's not always about, we were just winners all the time. Like we, you went through a lot of failure as well. And you knew how to, to get back on the horse again, if you will, and and just keep going, right. Just keep grinding it. Even if you're you got kicked in the face a little bit, you know, as, as we all have. So, man, I appreciate you sharing your story and you get out to Vegas. Let's play some golf and uh, I'll see you next time, man. I appreciate it. Sound good. Thanks for having me, Chad. All right. Thank you. All right. That was a great conversation with John Denton. He's got a lot of good stuff. So I'm really glad that I brought him on. I appreciate you, John, sharing your story, being open about uh, just kind of some of the things that went on at UNLV. And, and I think you're a great example of just the grind, right? To to do five or six teams being cut from the NFL and to keep going, right? And, and I know definitely what it feels like to to kind of be in that boat of, of I'm trying to wonder, do I keep going? I still have this dream. I still want to fulfill it. But now you get to the point where you you're married, you have kids, right? So there's just a lot of family decisions, life decisions to make. So it sounds like you're doing awesome. So I really appreciate you coming on board. I want to remind you again of my Mental Edge Life Coaching Program. So if you or yourself, your athlete, if you're a former athlete, want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, go ahead and email me at chad at mentaledge.coach. I'd love to set up a personal one-on-one -on -one call with you, see if we're a good fit, and to see how I can help you in your life. We'll see you in the next episode. Take care.